Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Hake here in Southern India. I'd like to conclude the series of videos on Gadamer's Truth and Method by focusing today on the final part of the book. This is part three, the ontological shift of hermeneutics guided by language. Now, if you have not seen the first three videos on this series, I'd recommend you to check those out. Uh, but in this video, we'll finally get around to um, focusing on Gadamer's own understanding of hermeneutics, maybe more so than the big emphasis he has in the first two parts of the book on a really thorough historical analysis of other thinkers' uh, views on the matter. Rather, here in part three, we get to see um, what um, Gadamer thinks of hermeneutics, and above all, Gadamer is a linguistic turn thinker. So chapter one of this part is titled Language as the Medium of Hermeneutic Experience. In other words, for Gadamer, the problem with the traditional tendency to overemphasize interpretation as something like a subjective methodological activity is that understanding or the failure of understanding is more like an event that happens to you rather than something that you do. So if you observe your own experience of any really genuine conversation, it's incorrect to say that you actually conduct it. Rather, a genuine conversation is one which you fall into. A conducted conversation is something of a contradiction in terms. If it's fully conducted, it's not a real conversation at all. And therefore, we can only understand this post-subjective stance on hermeneutics if we rephrase the problem linguistically. For Gadamer, language is the intrinsic medium in which understanding and the hermeneutical experience has to occur. He says himself that this whole process is verbal. Some evidence for this link between language and understanding is that translating a text into a new language, Gadamer says, is in itself always a new interpretation. Even if you're meaning to translate, there's still this element of interpreting because there's always this element of highlighting in the process. So you cannot engage with it in the medium of language without having some element of interpretation involved. Likewise, in communication, there's a fusion of horizons. In conversation, what is expressed is not only mine or the author's, but is rather something which is inherently common. And he argues that the linguistic turn is the only way to account for that. So if you just look at the example of history, um, further evidence of this link between uh, language and understanding is that some past civilization can only really become a part of our world if it has written texts. If literally the only thing left behind are these vast physical monuments, the historical dimension as such is inaccessible to us. This is because the text can express a whole in the hermeneutical sense of the word, but a stone monument in itself cannot do that, says Gadamer. Writing is therefore central to the hermeneutical phenomenon. Writing is something like hermeneutics purified, says Gadamer. And although he does deal with things like performance in dance and sculpture, he doesn't mean to rule those out because they're not literally written texts. He does say that writing has a very special place because that's where you see hermeneutics in a type of purified state. So the interesting thing about approaches to the same text, though, is that even though there is literally just one single text, um, it can sustain many different ways of interpretation. And yet, not only is it wrong to say that only one of them could be true and all of the others are false, um, it's also wrong to um, downplay the extent to which each of them actually has its own claim to truth. Truth in this hermeneutical sense, being something other than the kind of truth arrived at by the scientific method, for example. Um, and therefore, the hermeneutical phenomenon is, Gadamer says, the unity of understanding and interpretation. Language is the horizon of a hermeneutical ontology, which um, Zizek describes Gadamer's position as, to be is to be understood. Um, therefore, he is interested, Gadamer is, in ecology because the linguistic world in which understanding occurs um, cannot be likened to the ecological habitat 
in which a biological organism functions. Other creatures, he admits, are embedded in their environments. Only man, however, has a world. And this is because only man is defined by a type of freedom from his environment, a freedom which inevitably implies the linguistic cons constitution of the world. I quote him to say, to rise above the pressure of what impinges on us from the world means to have language and to have a world. A free distanced orientation is always only to be realized within language. Likewise, there can be no such thing as a world in itself which lies beyond language. The very notion of looking for any being in itself, he claims, is just an appeal to the Greek distinction between substance and motion that you find in, say, Aristotle's physics. Um, this is inherent in the knowledge of the natural sciences, he claims, and how they approach beings. Yet Gadamer interprets this stance as inherently oriented towards domination. That is, ironically enough, the movement away from language to objectivity is the true source of domination. Therefore, the biological inquiry into habitat intrinsically presents the materials uh, observed as these sorts of beings in themselves with this indebtedness to ancient Greek epistemology. Eventually, however, one hopes to reduce um, human perception itself um, if one follows this methodology down to some mathematical formalization. Um, however, Gadamer finds this troubling because the very notion of an absolute object, which is shot out in these investigations, is itself a subtle form of doublethink. That is to say, if you are speaking of an object, you have already ruled out any notion of absoluteness. This is because, contrary to expectation, even the sciences themselves are incapable of actually transcending their horizons. A linguistic world is one which is impossible to simply see from the outside as a complete object, as the ideal animal habitat would seem to be if you were to use that as the standard for our world. Animals also differ in that they, they might switch habitats. You might have um, an invasive species, um, or you might have uh, an animal artificially moved to a zoo, or something like that. Um, so animals can legitimately switch habitats, but um, people don't do that so much as they adopt new languages. That's what the difference is in having a world rather than a habitat. For Gadamer, therefore, language is intrinsically not calculation, or domination or use. Language is rather prejudice. Mathematical scientific formalization, however, is inherently supposed to squeeze out the possibility for this kind of prejudice. In fact, at the scientific revolution, Bacon made this into a methodological goal. He, as I quote him, had to make room for new scientific constructs by directly opposing the prejudice of language and its naive teleology. Therefore, modern theory is a tool of construction by means of which we gather experiences together in a unified way and make it possible to dominate them, as I quote him himself on page 454. Human experience of the world is, however, originally linguistic in nature. Um, hermeneutics is historical finitude because language is constantly being formed and developed. The event, therefore, that takes place in all understanding is linguistic connection between present and tradition. Hermeneutic experience implies an event of language. This inherently negates any hope for some dogmatic meaning in itself. Being is such an event. All understanding has further the character of something like an event. And this holds true for the true as well. Uh, genuine experience is the encounter with something that asserts itself as truth. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of this series on Truth and Method by Gadamer, a very long, very dense, but very important text. Thank you for listening to the end, and I do recommend you to read this book.